In today's video, we are going to be installing my favorite electric outlet. This is a 240 volt, 50 amp outlet. The 240 volt, 50 amp outlet really is a universal kind of outlet. You can use it to charge up an electric vehicle. You can super fast charge things like battery power stations, and you can run heavy duty equipment. Now my immediate need for this thing is to run my 240 volt welder, but the way I'm going to install this, I will be able to use this outlet for any of those purposes that I described, but I'm also going to cover some huge mistakes that other YouTubers are just outright making whether they don't understand the electric code or they're just choosing to do it wrong, doing this type of work is of course at your own risk and you've got to decide if it's something you want to do. Hire an electrician if you can't do the job yourself or you have any doubts. For most people, the best choice for this outlet is going to be to use a six gauge three conductor cable. Now technically, it's got four wires inside this cable. You've got two hot wires, which are the red and the black, and additionally, you've got a white neutral wire, and then of course, you've got your ground. It's only referred to as a three conductor because it's got the neutral and two hots. That is your three conductors. The ground is just always assumed that it will be there. Welding outlets often just require two wires in total plus a ground. They don't use the neutral. But if you go that route, you will be making a huge mistake, but it will cost you big time when you have to repeat this in the future because you just can't run other stuff. Doing it my way will allow you to run your welder today, but any new equipment that comes out down the road, you're gonna be completely set up for. This cable is also called non-metallic. That's because it's got this sheathing on the outside of the cord. Now this jacket is essentially protecting the inside wires from damage and to be code compliant, this cable needs to be run inside of a protected space. That can be in places like between studs, between floor joists, but at no point can the cable go beyond your studs. Next, you're going to need your outlet. You can find these things at every Home Depot. This is a 240 volt outlet. It's made by Lebanon, made right in the USA. It's UL listed and it is rated for 50 amps. Here I've got the same type of Hubble 50 amp outlet, same plug style, and it's also rated for 50 amps, made in the USA, and it's UL listed. The Lebanon outlet sells for about $12 and the Hubble is actually closer to 80. It's not that this outlet being $12 can in fact put out 50 amps of juice. The problem is that 50 amp outlets are not new. They've been around for decades. They were used for things like ranges, stoves, electric dryers, but those appliances are only used part time. Meaning that even if you run your dryer say all day long, it might only be using 25 amps of juice throughout a course of the day. And that might only total two or three hours. Using it that way is totally fine. That's exactly what this $12 outlet was designed for. Those uses are very intermittent. They might seem long to you, but that just isn't a long period of time when you compare it to something like battery charging. If you plug this 240 volt outlet into a car, you could be charging that car for 20 hours or more. You might even be drawing up to 40 amps or more power through that outlet continuously. It's going to keep overheating the outlet and there are dozens of cases online where you will see these cheaper outlets are just melting. If you're going to go to the trouble of installing one of these outlets, you want to look for an outlet that has the tag EV on it, even if you're using it for something like a welder today, because that means that the outlet is going to be much better made, designed for a high amperage continuous application. Now let's talk about the electric box. This is where everybody messes up because they go to the store, they buy possibly a metal box, and they quickly find out that, man, this outlet is big. You're going to go to stuff it in there. It's not going to fit in well and you're gonna have a nightmare. This is the exact box you wanna buy. I searched for weeks to find the biggest electric box that would still fit into a normal two by four wall. This box is the largest by far. Now, of course, the third item you're gonna need is a place in your circuit breaker panel to tie your new circuit in. That means you will have to look at your circuit breaker panel and you're looking for two circuit breaker positions because this is a 240 volt circuit. But this is another area where people really mess up. Back in 2020, there was a change to the electric code and that change requires a GFCI breaker even for 240 volt 50 amp circuits like this. So you are required to use a 240 volt 50 amp circuit breaker with GFCI protection. So if you want to do the job right, you will need to use a GFCI breaker. I've got my cable. Now I went ahead and purchased a 125 foot version of six gauge three conductor cable. We've already looked at our panel and I know I've got two spots open on the circuit breaker panel. First, we'll want to get our new electric box ready. For that, we need to use one of these knockouts on the top of the box. This box can be rotated a number of different ways and it's got all kinds of different size knockouts. Once you get this oriented the way you want, I ended up with a one inch potential knockout on the top. Now just take a flathead screwdriver, place it against the knockout, give it a swift hit, and it should punch out. It often won't fall out completely, so just rock it back and forth if it doesn't come out like this, and you can remove it, and now you'll be left with a burr-free hole. It all starts by simply mounting the box to the wall. All the holes are pre-drilled. I'll start by placing it against the stud, and we'll screw it into place. 
But we'll notice right away that the box is kind of kinked. It's not really right. It's going to wobble over time. So I am going to actually install a small block of wood next to it to secure this outlet into place. With our box in position, we're actually ready to begin running the cable. Now, I don't know where your outlet is in relation to your circuit breaker panel, but mine is about 60 feet away. You're gonna be required to drill some holes through your studs to allow this cable to pass through. Keeping in mind, this cable has to be within the wall cavities. Now, you do have an option. If you wanna put it on the outside and run it kind of any way you want, you can use something called armored cable, or you can run the cable inside conduit. Now, you're not gonna to wanna to run this cable inside of a pipe, but you can get a different type of cable called THHN. But I think for most people doing this themselves, you're gonna to wanna to find a way to run this non-metallic cable within the stud base as I'm doing here. I drilled my holes to about an inch and a quarter. That's maybe a quarter inch bigger than you might have needed for the job. That little bit of extra room makes this job easier, especially as I'm pushing and pulling this cable around some tight bends. With this cable finally run from the outlet all the way to the circuit breaker panel, we're ready to now connect each end. Now again, I am gonna recommend starting with your receptacle first. One trick I do is if I have the room and the space, I will actually strip the jacket off before I insert it into the box. Now my wire is cleanly in the box and that insulation is already ready to go. You're always gonna to wanna to leave about a half inch to an inch of insulation sticking beyond the clamp so that you know you're not clamping down those wires directly. Each one of these receptacles is gonna have some information on the side or the back of it and you'll wanna pay attention to it closely. The first is called the strip gauge. That is the amount of insulation that you will remove so that that wire will fit into that specific receptacle perfectly. This Hubble is a bit confusing because it's one of the few strip gauges that also includes a little bit of insulation. To do the job correctly, you're only gonna remove the insulation to expose the amount of wire shown. The little bit of insulation is to just give you a reference as to where the end of the wire is going to be for stripping. Now you can either use dedicated six gauge wire strippers if you own those, or in my case, I don't have them, so I'm gonna use these electrician scissors. Now the trick I find with these is to simply score it with the scissors. Two different ways, I'm gonna gently do it. Now this stuff is thick wire. This is not gonna just pull off like your normal electric wire. And then I will use my electrician's pliers to get a hold of the insulation. I twist it clockwise, which is the same direction as the cable, going forward until it finally breaks that insulation, and then I can remove it off the conductor. So again, I'm just lightly pressing. I can feel it go through the jacket. Twist it to break that bond. There we go, we got our neutral. So now we have our three finished connections. You wanna take a look and make sure that none of this, any insulation somehow shredded or something and got onto the wires. You wanna use some scissors to get in there to cut it, but I only see a little tiny thread. The outlet here is an L1540. It's got four prongs, two huts, a ground, and a neutral. Again, I highly recommend wiring all four wires and using this style outlet. The red and the black are my hot wires. Each of these is putting out 120 volts. Next, we're also going to have our ground and our neutral. Now the ground is of course the bare copper wire and that gets tightened in as well. Since I am using a metal box, you may not be aware that you also need to ground not just the receptacle, but the box itself. Now if you're using a different type of metal box, you may not even have the included screw, but they're cheap and easy to get. Just simply wrap the wire around the grounding screw tighten it down, and now the extra wire will be fed into the receptacle itself. This Hubble is super well made and it actually uses hex or Allen type key screws built into the bottom of the outlet. They've even got a V type of a clamp. That's gonna be much better for clamping down on this wire. Now you can tighten these down until they feel super secure. This is heavy gauge wire. It's really hard to over compress it. Next, we'll do our other hot. Got a hot in there. All right, get all three snug. But if you wanna do it according to the book, there are settings on the outlet itself giving you torque values. Then you will use a torque wrench or a screwdriver to tighten these down. Now here I've got this micro torque wrench. It's actually designed for carbon fiber work on bicycles. Here's the setting required by this outlet that I'm using. I've put it up in inch pounds and also Newton meters. And if you haven't used one of these torque wrenches before, it does take the guesswork out of it. So that's it. Okay. 
this one I'm not going to torque because it's significantly smaller than the other conductors. And now we've got our ground in as well. Now that the outlet is wired in, how the heck do you get this thing in the box? This outlet actually attaches to the faceplate. Now the other bonus here is this faceplate gives you some extra depth. Your receptacle includes these four screws. We will simply tighten them onto the outlet, and now we've got our combination faceplate and receptacle all in one, and we've just got to simply attach it to the box. This is where you're going to see how heavy these wires are, man, they are tough. As you're wrapping them in, I would recommend that you kind of coil them like this. It's going to make a sort of spring but you'll slowly work it into position. Now I can go ahead and fasten this plate to the box and it's only attached with just two screws. We've got four screws overall, but for some reason they only drill holes on each side with one screw. But as you tighten down just these two screws, this is the most solid box I've ever installed. Now we're at the circuit breaker panel. We've got to start by giving ourselves access just like we did with the receptacle box. Begin by knocking one of those knockouts out. Now where yours is is going to be up to you. I have one opening on the top. it back and forth we'll break it out you can see that double ring so don't panic when you do this if it doesn't come right out it's very normal on these double and they even have triple and quadruple like this full-size one here don't leave these in the panel make sure you get them out afterwards and I need to get out the little bit of the ring that didn't come out Use the correct size cable clamp, similar to what we did on the receptacle. Only here, mine is a three-quarter inch version, and that is still fine for the 6.3 cable. I will slide the cable through. Here, I'm going to remove that insulation after I get it installed, mainly because I don't want to damage the cable, and there is a lot of stuff going on inside this circuit breaker panel. As soon as I get it in position, I'm going to tighten that clamp down. I want to restrict any movement of the clamp while I'm doing this work. Next, I'm going to lightly score this jacket. So very lightly score it, and with that score, you'll be able to go ahead and pull the insulation back, removing it up to about a half inch to an inch, sticking beyond the clamp inside your breaker panel. Now, this is where you get to be a bit of an artist. You need to get those wires over to where your breaker is going to go. I know I'm using a GFCI breaker, so I'm gonna fold the wire around, kind of keeping it at angles. I'm using a 50 amp GFCI breaker made by Eaton, and this has got three screw terminals on it. Now that ground wire needs to be fastened to our ground bar inside my panel. I'll do that by unscrewing one of the screws, bending that ground wire in, and fasten it to my ground bar and securely tightening it down. Now we need to connect our wires to the GFCI breaker. Unfortunately, this is actually pretty easy. Here we're only going to remove a very small amount. So I started doing the same type of stripping of this wire that I did on the receptacle, and I actually noticed that I was stripping way too much. It is not a good idea to have a lot of copper showing once it's under the terminal in your panel. So here I'm going to go ahead and cut off the excess. Oftentimes when you're wiring up a circuit breaker, it's recommended to kind of connect the wire outside the panel and then install the breaker. This wire is very heavy. You're not going to be able to get the breaker into position correctly, so I would recommend go ahead and install the breaker first. Have it in the off position while you're working, of course, and I'd also recommend keep your main panel power completely off and you don't have to worry at all. Now we need to connect up our three wires, our two huts and our neutral. On this breaker, the neutral is marked with this white dot. I'll connect up both of our hot wires. We'll tighten them down. I'm not going all the way yet, but just like our receptacle, this thing also has some torque ratings. If you can use them, it is definitely the better way to do it. This particular breaker recommends 28 inch pounds. I'll set that on my tool and I will simply tighten them down until I hear the click. We'll move on to our neutral. And that should do it. These are nice and firm. At that point, all three of these wires are connected, but I'm still left with this one. Because this is a GFCI breaker, we've got this pigtail. Normally, these neutral wires actually get wired to the neutral bar. Here, the GFCI breaker gets installed in line. That means our neutral from our receptacle goes to the breaker first. Then it goes out this pigtail, and we need to wire this into our neutral bar. It is generally code approved to put multiple ground wires under the same screw, but never to mix ground and neutrals under a single screw. Some of you viewers right now are probably saying, wait a second, 
this is a sub panel in your house and you have your grounds and your neutrals on the same bars, that's completely against code. And you would be correct, but you'd also be wrong at exactly the same time. This house was built about 30 years ago and 30 years ago, there was no such code requiring those things to be separated. Back then, accessory buildings, things like workshops and garages were required by code to have their own grounding systems. So this building actually has its own grounding rod. Now by today's standards, they say that is not as safe as the current requirement and that may be true, but I'm not required to make this change and I can't easily make it because I do not have a ground wire going between the two structures. But now I've got some tidying up to do. The cable isn't secured at all outside of these boxes. In most installations, when you're using non-metallic cable, you are required to tack down the cable with either a staple or another device at 12 inches or less from the box. And there are lots of tricks for putting staples in in tight spaces, but they're still a pain in the ass, and this is gonna be a lot easier. Here's a larger staple with this plastic housing, and if I put it over this cable, because it's rounded, you can see it doesn't really fit properly. Now you can beat this thing in a submission, and it will hold the cable down, but there's a good chance you're gonna pinch it, and it's just not a good fit. You don't have to use staples at all. In fact, the code allows you to use a number of different devices. They do not dictate what you have to use. Instead, I'm gonna use these cable clamps. Now you may not have seen these before, they will do the job and hold the cable perfectly. I can just use my screwdriver to put them into position. Now I do have this right angle one that will make it a bit easier, but you can still do this by hand or use another type of screwdriver. And I won't need to use them at all across the roofing area because it is supported by the holes themselves. With the final one in position, this outlet is complete. Now with everything secure and in place, it's time to test out my new outlet. And now at this point, the circuit should be energized. Here at the receptacle, we're gonna test the power using a voltmeter. With the meter set to AC, if I take my two probes and I put them in the outer prongs, it's measuring 240 volts. Now it's gonna always be off a bit like this, but this is still totally acceptable. But if I take one of my probes and I connect it to either the neutral or the ground, I am now seeing just the single 120 volt from each side. I'd recommend you check each side, repeat it with the ground as well, and now you can be sure that your outlet is putting out the correct voltage. Our last test is to just try out the built-in GFCI test on the breaker itself. And just like those clicks on your wall outlets with GFCI protection, this breaker is working perfectly and our outlet is tested good and we're ready to use it. Now this 1540 plug type is perfect for an EV charger and it will fit tons of different battery charging cords. But what if you've got a welder like me? Their plugs only require three wires. Better option is to use this adapter cable. All it's doing is bypassing that neutral wire. I don't need it for a welding application and for this plug. So now I can plug this thing in, I can run my welder. And as an added bonus, it's got this green light, just shows me that the power is on. That's not even something that came with the outlet itself. So that is the 50 amp installation. The job is done. I'm really pleased with the results and I think this outlet is gonna serve me well for a really long time. And I hope you like this video. If you have any questions or comments about the video or things that I may have done wrong in the video or you don't agree with, be sure to leave me a comment below. And if you liked it, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the Silver Symbol channel for more videos coming up.